Father, we love you, Lord, and we are just grateful tonight, Lord God, just to gather in your name, Lord, whether we're here in your house, Lord God, or whether we are on home, at home or watching somewhere else, Lord God, we know that you will, your presence is with us, and we know, Lord God, that you, Lord, will always be with us, Lord. You'll never leave us nor forsake us, Lord, and we rest in that, and I pray, Lord God, that wherever we are, that we would give you our undivided attention, that, there, that our attention to you, to your word, would be an act of worship that we would show you, Lord God, by our study, by our meditation, by seeking you, even tonight, Lord God, that we want to know you more, that we want to understand your heart, Lord God, that we want wisdom in our life. And I pray, Lord God, as we come before you tonight, Lord, that you would meet with us, that you would speak to us. It would not be a preacher. It would be your spirit, Lord God, that would make your word come alive in our hearts. You have your way, Lord. We love you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. Good to see you once again. Let's turn our Bibles back to Proverbs chapter 17. Okay? We're going to pick it up right where we left off last week. Again, Proverbs chapter 17. If you can find your place at verse 13 again. Verse 13 tonight is where we will begin, but as I always do, again, every week, and I will continue to do this, as we open up Proverbs, again, we come to remind ourselves what this book is all about. Why were we given this book? Why are we supposed to study this book? And the reason, again, Solomon told us at the very beginning that we would know wisdom, okay, and instruction to understand words of insight. And I defined wisdom for you as the practical application of knowledge. And so we are studying this book, these chapters, these verses, not just for information, right? Not just to know more Bible verses, but hopefully so that we can take what we are learning and apply it to our lives on a daily basis. Someone say amen to that, right? That needs to be our focus, that we would be changed by what we learn, that these words of insight, beautiful, incredible words of insight would make a difference in the things we say in the things that we do, and again, in the actions that we take. And so, again, this has been my heart as I've been praying and asking the Lord to change me. I pray that you're praying the same thing. And so, let's pick it up here again, right where we left off last week. Verse 13, as we continue, Solomon writes, If anyone returns evil for good, evil will not depart from his house. Now, think about, again, how relevant this verse is. We live in a day when sadly there are many people that are returning evil for good. And so I read this and I thought, wow, this, this speaks loud and clear. And you think about how ugly, how terrible it is for someone to do someone harm, to do someone wrong, to return evil after that person has done them good. It is not only bad, it is not only wrong, it is not only unjust, but think about this. One of the things that happens often, because we're all human, is when we try to do good, when we try to do a good thing, a, do de a good deed, and someone stabs us in the back, someone mistreats us, someone is ungrateful, it can discourage us, can it? It can cause us to think, what good is it to do good, right? What's the use? And that happens. People can so easily be discouraged after they've tried to do something good that God makes it very clear that those who do that, those who bring discouragement, those who do evil to those who have done them good, the Bible makes it clear. Evil will not depart from their house. In other words, God will make sure to punish those who do that. And that is the same exact thing the Apostle Paul says in Colossians 3.25. Paul writes, but if you do what is wrong, you will be paid back for the wrong you have done. Now, it's important to remember when we read a verse like this is that Paul was writing to the church in Colossae. In other words, he's writing to Christians. Too many Christians think that because we're Christians that we won't be disciplined or punished by God. That's not Bible. You might think that. You might even hope that. But Paul makes it clear to the Christians in Colossae, if you do what is wrong, you will be 
paid back for the wrong you have done, for God has no favorites. In other words, God doesn't show favoritism. Just because you're a child of God, don't think it exempts you from being punished, from being disciplined by God. This is really important. And the sad thing, what's interesting about this, whenever I read about Solomon and remind myself that Solomon is writing these verses, you wonder how many lessons he learned from his father, David. How many lessons he learned from his mother, Bathsheba. Now, if you know the story of David and Bathsheba, you know that because of their sin, specifically the adultery and then murder of Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, God forgave David, and God is a forgiving God. But remember, they had to reap the consequences in their household till the day they died. And that is so important. Such a reminder, again, God is good, God is merciful, God is forgiving. Yes, he is a God of second chances, but we will still reap what we have sown. Verse 14, the beginning of strife is like letting out water. So quit before the quarrel breaks out. Now, I love this. Solomon talks about the letting out of water. And the picture that he literally is describing is the water that begins to seep out of a crack uh, on a dam. Okay? I want you to imagine a dam. And there's a crack in the dam. And little by little, water begins to seep out. Now, at the very beginning, when, there's, when the crack is small and there's just a little bit of water coming out, that water can easily be stopped, right? That the crack can be patched. The crack can be fixed. It can be repaired. But what happens if the owner or the manager of the dam doesn't fix it? He just allows water to continually come out. You know what will happen, right? It's not going to fix itself. Eventually, that crack is going to get bigger, and more water is going to come out, and it's eventually going to break or destroy the dam. When too much water eventually starts pouring forth, the water becomes uncontrollable. We get that picture, right? Coming out too much now. You can't stop it. You cannot stop it. And so this is what Solomon is describing. Look back at the verse. He says, the beginning of strife is like letting out of water, so quit before the quarrel breaks out. Solomon is telling us that in the same way that it's a lot easier, it's a lot simpler to repair a crack in a dam and to stop the water from pouring out, it's a lot easier to do that at the beginning than when water's uncontrollable. Well, the same thing applies to an argument with somebody, to an argument with your spouse, to an argument, again, with your, your, your best friend. It's a lot easier at the beginning, right? Before things get out of control, before tempers flare, It's a lot easier to to resolve the conflict, right? The strife, to fix the problem. Because if you let it go, if you let, again, something get out of control, then it's going to be really hard to fix. You should have fixed it at the very beginning. You should have fixed it before things got worse, before things get out of control. And I love it because we get that picture. We understand, again, that it's easier to fix that dam at the very beginning. And the same holds true when we find ourselves in conflict, when we have an argument with someone, when there's a fight, whatever we want to call it, we better fix it at the very beginning before it gets worse. And this is what Paul alludes to. You guys might know this verse. Ephesians 4.26, Paul says, in your anger, we get angry in a fight, right? We get emotional, we get upset, We get frustrated. In your anger, do not sin. Do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Now, I love this. And I love this specifically, right, in the the context of marriage. You get into a fight with your spouse. You better fix it that night. Resolve it. Apologize. Do what's necessary so that you can go to bed, right, and start fresh in the morning. 
How many of you like to wake up the next day and you're looking at your spouse still mad, right? No, no. You want to fix it now. You want to fix it before you go to bed, before the sun goes down. Now, if you learn to do that, right? If you learn to fix your problems, apologize, humble yourself, whatever it is, say you're sorry. At the very beginning, how many, think about it, how many arguments would be stopped from going out of control? Isn't that right? It's kind of simple. Wisdom says, fix it at the beginning. Fix it before it gets worse. Put your pride away. Say you're sorry. Again, humble yourself. Do what's necessary. Otherwise, you're going to end up saying the wrong thing. You're going to end up doing the wrong thing. Things are going to get out of control. And then, man, then it's going to be really hard to fix. How many marriages, again, ended because someone couldn't learn to say they were sorry? They couldn't humble themselves. They couldn't apologize. And so I love this because this is so practical to our everyday life. If you're in an argument with someone tonight, fix it before it gets worse. It's not going to fix itself. Do what you got to do. Pray about it. Bring it before the Lord. But make sure you fix it before things get worse. Verse 15. He who justifies the wicked and he who contemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to the Lord. Now, we know that we serve a God of righteousness. Everything God promotes is righteousness. And we serve a God who is just, okay? Which means fair, that he desires fairness. He desires justice. It's for that reason that God, in his justness, desires that the wicked be punished, that they would pay for their sins, and the innocent would be shown to be just that, that they are innocent, that they are let off the hook. But think about a judge, a judge who would acquit the guilty, let the guilty go, and punish the innocent. Now, how sad. I think we see that happen in the day and age that we're living in, right? No more bail. Just letting criminals out on the street, not causing them or forcing them to pay for their crime. It's unjust. These are judges that are, again, are district attorneys, again, that are letting people go free, and it is just wrong. It is just wrong. And we see this. This violates the justice of God, okay? People should pay for their crimes. But what do we see here? We live in a day, interesting, that Isaiah spoke about. Isaiah, Isaiah talked about a time when people would call evil good and good evil. And that's what's happening. There are things talking about today, again, that three years ago, we would have never thought they'd talk about. We would never see people pushing. I was reading the paper uh, uh, yesterday online, I think it was yesterday or Monday, and it was talking about Joe Biden's sister. I guess Joe Biden? And she's, uh, again, pro-abortion. And she says that the, 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 the problem with the pro-abortion, those for abortion, the problem with their stance is not their viewpoint. She believes that abortion is right and should be legalized across the world, but her issue is the messaging, she said. That's what she said. The messaging. She says, we are really pro-life. We're for the woman. We're not for the baby. But we are pro-life. That's what she said. And I thought, that is crazy. That is crazy. And, that, and they're buying it. And the newscasters, and they're, you know, they're interviewing. They're just soaking it all up like, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm waiting for them to say, preach it. Or, you know, something like that. Because it's so ridiculous. But this is what we're up against now. People calling good evil and calling evil good. And again, this is what Isaiah said, right? Isaiah said it in Isaiah 5.20, what sorrow for those who say that evil is good and good is evil, that dark is light and light is dark, that bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. And we are living in that day, guys. We are living in that day today. When people, again, say that God is wrong and that his word is wrong. But think about how scary that is for a second. 
for someone to think that they are a better judge of what is right or wrong than God is. That's what they make themselves. When they say that what God says is wrong, they are proclaiming themselves to be a better judge than God. And sadly, they're going to one day stand before the judge of all the earth and have to give an account for the things that they've done and the things that they've said. Verse 16, why should a fool have money in his hand to buy wisdom when he has no sense? No, I love it. It's a question. Solomon is asking a question. And his question is, why, why should someone think that they can buy wisdom with money? And I like the question. Why would anyone think that they can buy wisdom with money? Let me ask you, can you buy wisdom with money? No. You cannot buy wisdom with money. That's foolish. Only a foolish person would think that. You cannot buy wisdom with money. How do you get wisdom? Wisdom comes in two ways, right? We ask the Lord to give us wisdom, and we seek it out. We study. We learn God's word. You guys, again, are studying wisdom tonight. That's why you're, you're here tonight. You're seeking out wisdom. You can't buy it with money. Now, the New Living Translation has it this way. I kind of like the way it, it's shared. It is senseless to pay to educate a fool since he has no heart for learning. Now, I like that. I, I like the way it puts that. And to me, it is a lesson, and I think you would all agree with me, it is a lesson that not everybody should go to college. Would you agree with that? Not everybody should go to college. I want you to think about how many people, and again, one of the big things you hear right now is, you know, all these people pushing for the government to wipe out all the student loans, right? So many that have invested tens of thousands of dollars, some hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? in degrees that are worthless to them, right? Maybe they shouldn't have studied, you know, basket weaving or something along those lines. <laughs> but now they have, and they're upset, and they want the government to wipe all this out. Well, number one, I would ask them, what happened to integrity? Being a person of your word, did you sign that contract? If you sign that contract, then be responsible to pay it, right? I got to pay my bills. It's only right. But again, I, I kind of feel for them. I, I understand, again, college debt is a terrible thing to have over your head. But it brings me back to the verse. How many of them went to college because their parents told them to go to college? How many of them went to college because everyone said, well, you just have to go? And they went, and either they went, and they really, their heart wasn't there, or how many on the other side just dropped out and never finished, Right? never graduated, never got a degree. And so how much money over the years has been wasted on people that really didn't have a heart to learn? And that's exactly what Solomon is talking about. Money can't buy you an education, right? You have to study. You have to put in the work, right? You have to spend the time. You have to do what's necessary, now, I want to be clear because I don't want someone to come up to me after and say, hey, pastor, what's wrong with college? I'm all for college. I just don't think it's for everybody, right? It's not for everybody. I think today specifically, for a younger person listening, a better option is trade school. Trade school, right? Going and joining something where you can learn a trade that you can immediately right after college, right? Have a job, electrician, plumber, again, the list goes on. So many great trades out there, far cheaper than college anyways. But it's such a better option that others can have. Again, specifically to force someone to go to college that really doesn't want to be there, you can't buy an education. What a good verse. Verse 17, a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. No, I like this. I like the verse. Solomon describes the difference between a friend and a blood brother, we would say. Okay? Interesting. Very interesting verse. The difference between a friend or a blood brother, or you ladies can say a friend and a blood sister. That's what he's describing. Now think about something. 
I think we would all agree that our friends, if you think of whoever your close friends are, they are those that you share interests with, right? Common interests with. You do things together. You enjoy things together, right? You went to the same school. You Again, whatever the commonality was, it's because you share commonality that makes you close. And then you share time. You spend time together in doing these things. And over time, you build these close relationships. Because you build these close relationships with people that are like you or do things that you like, they're always there for you. And you're always there for them because, again, you share common interests. And through the good times and bad, if they are true friends and not fair weather friends, right, they have been there. They are there. But interesting, when it comes to siblings, how many of you know that you can have siblings that you're not really close to? How come? Because we pick our friends, we don't pick our siblings. Isn't that right? Is that true? It's true. Oftentimes, our siblings are, they're different from us. They don't share what we share with our friends, which is why oftentimes we are closer to our friends than we are to our siblings. That's what Solomon is talking about. Now, the beautiful thing about siblings, regardless of whether we are close to them or not, is that we are always there for our siblings. And we should always be there for our siblings, as they should always be there for us. And this is what Solomon is talking about. A friend loves at all times. They're always there for us because we're close to them. But a brother is born for adversity. In other words, although we might not be close to our brother or sister or spend a lot of time with them like we do our friends, when a time of crisis comes, they'll always be there. Okay, as we should always be there for them. The benefit of having siblings and friends. Verse 18, one who lacks sense gives a pledge and puts up security in the presence of his neighbor. Now, after talking about friendship, one of the things that could happen is a friend could come up to you and ask you to co-sign for them. And Solomon says, that's not a smart thing to do. One who lacks sense gives a pledge and puts up security in the presence of his neighbor. Solomon's talked about it before. It's not a good idea to risk your life, your financial stability on someone else because God calls everyone to be responsible for themselves. Allow people to be responsible for yourself. God expects us to be responsible for ourself. Verse 19, whoever loves transgression loves strife. Now, transgression is another word for sin. The word transgression simply means to cross the line, to go over what God says is right. Solomon says, whoever loves this, loves to do this, loves strife. And that's interesting. I think we all know that when we involved ourselves in sin, any kind of sin, we're asking for trouble. Isn't that right? Anyone who involves himself in sin, any kind of sin, is asking for trouble. And that's what Solomon says. We would say it this way. Whoever loves transgression must love strife because that's what you're going to get. Because that is what your sinful actions will bring. And he who makes his door high seeks destruction. Now, this is interesting. What does that mean to make your door high? And this is a picture of people who do not have their trust in the Lord, but who make their trust in their home. They build big homes with big walls and big doors to protect them. And in their homes, they look down on others as if they're okay and they're comfortable. And look what I have. God says that those who do that, they're just asking for destruction. They're just asking for trouble. Because when they do not trust God and trust in other things pridefully, they're just, again, they're just asking for it. Their pride will eventually bring about their downfall. Verse 20, a man of crooked heart does not discover good. And one with a dishonest tongue falls into calamity. 
Now Solomon makes it clear again, a person with a crooked heart, in other words, a twisted or corrupt heart, they'll never find good. They'll never prosper. Why will they never prosper? Because they will never have the blessing of God. Those who, again, want to defy God, who want to live in an ungodly way, will never prosper because God's blessing will never be upon their life. The same is true, again, for those not just with evil ways, but how about those with evil words, those who speak wicked words, those who are dishonest with their tongue will fall into calamity. We know this, that eventually your lies are going to catch up with you, right? Your lies will get you into trouble. And so wicked ways, wicked mouth, wicked tongue, again, both will bring about your destruction. Verse 21, he who sires a fool gets himself sorrow, and the father of a fool has no joy. Now, I want to remind you quickly that as Solomon is writing these proverbs, about a thousand BC is when Solomon lived. When he was writing these proverbs, this, he lived in a male-dominated society. Would you agree with that, right? This was the time, that culture specifically. And this was a culture where males were everything. And if there was one thing every father wanted, it was a son. A son to honor the family name, a son to carry on the family line. And so every father, again, valued his son, especially his firstborn son, above everything else. Because again, everything was riding on this son. Now Solomon says, but he who, desi- who sires who raises a fool, gets himself sorrow. And the father of a fool has no joy. Now, any parent in here, any parent in here, knows that there is nothing that will hurt you more than having a foolish child. Isn't that right? Again, there is no one who can hurt us like our children, right? Right? No one who can put us through the ringer like our children. And when, again, they disappoint you, when they go astray, when they make bad choices, oh, they bring grief upon the heart of a parent like no one else. And this is what he's talking about. Now, what's interesting about a parent, and we know this, right, is it doesn't matter how old our kids are, they're still our kids. We never stop being parents, right? It doesn't matter how old they are. We never stop being parents. And so if they continue to make bad choices, if they continue to be foolish in their 30s and 40s and 50s, how many of you know the pain never goes away, right? It still is heartbreaking. It still is disappointing, again, for every single parent. No parent wants to tell their kid, I told you so, right? We don't want to say that. We don't want to say that. We want the best for them. We don't take pleasure even when they have to learn their lesson the hard way. And so this is what Solomon is describing. And I love it. If you know Solomon's son again, uh, he blew it big time, Rehoboam. And you wonder if Solomon again was thinking about his son as he wrote this down. Now, let me show you something really interesting. Look back at the verse, and I want to point something out. I want you to notice that the word fool is mentioned twice. You guys see that? If you have a pen, underline it, okay? Let me show you something that you, don't under, you won't see or catch in the English. There's two words for fool here, but they're two different Hebrew words that mean two different things. The first word for fool means dull and thick-headed. Dull and thick-headed. The second word refers to a foolish person who lacks spiritual understanding, okay? Two different uh, Hebrew words. The first one, again, refers to someone, a kid that is just dumb and makes stupid choices. That's literally what it refers to. But the second one refers to a child that has no spiritual sensitivity to God or his word. Very, very interesting. 
Now, look back at the verse and read it again because it, this kind of brings more things to light. He who raises a dummy that makes bad choices, right, gets himself sorrow. And the father of a spiritual fool has no joy. This is so sad, right? Think about it again. It's the heart of every parent. Not only to see their children making wise choices in life, no doubt about it, but how about when we see them with no interest in God, lost in the world, lost in their sin? It is sad. All the joy, again, is ripped out of the parent's heart. Now this, again, after reading this, especially if you have young kids, is this a motivating verse, right? to make sure you pour into them the things of God, to raise them, to read the Bible to them, right? To do your best to instill wise things, wise principles, so that they would not only make good choices, but most importantly, that they would choose to serve the Lord when they are of age. Lord, help us again to do our diligence as parents and to set a godly example for them. Verse 22, a joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Now, I love, I love what Solomon is saying here. Solomon is basically saying that a person's psychological condition affects their spiritual well-being. I'll say it again. A person's psychological, their mindset affects their physical well-being. Those that have a positive and healthy outlook on life, they feel good about themselves. They're excited, right? They have purpose for living. They're motivated to live life. While those who are sad and depressed, it's like they have all the wind blown out of their sails. They're zapped of, of strength. They feel negative. And they have no desire to, 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 to do anything, to live life. Now, I love the verse because this verse reminds us, we often think that we are most affected by our circumstances. But that's not the case. Yes, our circumstances affect us. But Solomon reminds us that it's more so what's going on inside us that affects us than what is going on around us that affects us. I love it. Again, this is such a beautiful reminder. I want you to think about it. As Christians, we can have joy in our heart regardless of our circumstances. Isn't that right? Regardless of what's taking place. Think about it. Does it really matter what's taking place if we know that Jesus is coming back soon and heaven is our home? Nothing else matters, right? Do you really care about your bills? Do you care about your home or your 401k or your car? If Jesus was coming back next month, would it really matter? No, I love this. We can have joy through the ups and downs as I watch the news and I see what's happening and it's discouraging. I can have joy in my heart because, again, of the hope I found in God's word, because of the promises that he gives us. Now, this makes sense why those who don't know God or the promises are depressed. You know, so much, so much of the world is depressed. They have no hope. They have no joy. There's no joy in their heart, which is why they medicate themselves, which is why they distract themselves, which is why, again, they do all the things that they do, again, to try to fill themselves with what is missing in their life. And the sad thing is God is there all along wanting to give them the joy, right? The joy that is their strength. It can be their strength if they'll only turn to him. Verse 23, the wicked accepts a bribe in secret to pervert the ways of justice. Now, I've already mentioned that we serve a God of justice. God has ordained laws and God has ordained officials to enforce those laws, which means to secretly accept a bribe if you're a judge, if you're an official, in return to doing someone a favor. It's not only illegal, we know that, but it leads to people losing confidence in our justice system. 
Isn't that, isn't that today? People losing confidence in the justice system because of all the corruption. Because again, all the dirty handed, you know, secret deals that are made, again, that for the most part, we are not even aware of. This is why God, again, must deal with sin. This is why God must deal with those, again, who do these things. They might think that no one knows about it because they did it in secret, but how many of you know nothing is hidden from our God, right? He sees it all. No one's getting away with anything. Verse 24, the discerning sets his face toward wisdom. But the eyes of a fool are on the ends of the earth. No, I like this verse. I really like this verse. I think this is one of those verses we should especially have highlighted. Solomon makes a point here. That those that are wise, if you are truly wise, you will have a desire to continue to grow to continue to learn wisdom and to grow in the knowledge of God. If you really are wise, again, it will be shown because you will do wise things. You will continually study to learn and grow in the knowledge of God. This was Paul's heart. This was his mindset. You might remember Philippians 3.8. Paul says, indeed, I count everything as lost. And you might remember earlier in this chapter, he talked about all the things that he he once was and once had. And now he says, all that's rubbish. All that doesn't even matter because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. This should be our heart. This should be our prayer. Lord, I want to know you more, right? How do we know him more? The more we know his word motivating us again to study, to grow in wisdom. Well, Paul went on to say in verses 13 and 14, he tells the church in Philippi, brethren, brothers and sisters, I do not count myself to have apprehended. I'm not there yet. But one thing I do, you want to know what I do? You want to know what my life's about, Paul says? I forget those things which are behind and I reach forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This is what he lived for, to know God more, to truly come to know him in a greater way. I had a, a friend of mine over this uh, earlier today. He's a Bible teacher at at Golden Springs, and I was sharing with him, I says, you know, it's interesting, I've been serving Jesus uh, coming up on 32 years in August, but the last, specifically the last year, and I really mean this from my heart, I feel like I am am hearing more from God than I ever have in my 30-something years, relying on God's Spirit, spending more time with God, literally asking Him to speak to me, asking Him to fill me. And I will tell you, with, 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 as God is my witness, I truly believe I am, after all these years, right, truly hearing from God in a way that I never have. But that, I read this and I'm like, that, I, I want that to be me more than ever. I want to continue to grow and fall in love with God and get to know him in a greater way than I ever have. And I pray again, that is your heart as well. Now, the sad thing, notice the discerning, the wise sets his face on, on wisdom, but the eyes of a fool are on the ends of the earth. Those who don't read God's word, who don't want to read God's word, who don't want to have anything to do with God, they still want knowledge, right? They still want to be smart. There's so many out there in the world. But having rejected God's word, which is the only true place that we find true wisdom, they'll never find it. They will never find it. They are those that Paul would describe in 2 Timothy 3, 7. They are those that are always learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. How sad is that? How many people, right? Brilliant scientists. Knowledge beyond knowledge. Degrees, right? But lost. Lost because they have no knowledge True knowledge, right, that only comes from the way, the truth, and the life. Verse 25. A foolish son is a grief to his father and bitterness 
to her who bore him. Now, this is very similar, as you know, from verse 21, right, describing the pain that a foolish child brings to their parents. But notice this time, he focuses on the mother. The last time, specifically, was focused on the father. This time, he talks about the bitterness, the disappointment, the frustration a mother feels having bore that child. I believe, again, every mother, we all agree, has a special maternal bond with that child, right? She birthed that kid. And so he's describing, again, a different type of heartbreak because of the connection that every mother has with her child, how disappointing it is to having brought this kid into the world for him or her, again, to turn out to be such a bitter disappointment. Verse 26, almost done tonight. To impose a fine on a righteous man is not good, nor to strike the noble for their uprightness. Now again, Solomon's talking about a judge who punishes an innocent man in order to protect the guilty. We know that still happens today. And it is just as bad as a king who strikes a godly ruler for promoting righteousness. Think about how many examples we find in the Old Testament when the king was wicked and he punished the prophet. He punished, again, those that stood right before God simply because the king did not want to obey the Lord. Solomon says to do these things, to punish the innocent, or again, to uh, uh, punish the godly, those that are upright are both wrong and will be essentially punished by God. Verse 27, whoever restrains his words has knowledge, and he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. Now, we all would agree that listening to the words that come out of someone's mouth will be a good indicator whether that person is wise or a fool. All you got to do, right, is listen to the words that they speak. But notice, Solomon also says that you can tell a wise person because a wise person doesn't just say wise things. They also know when to keep quiet, right? They also know when not to speak. I love that. Wisdom teaches us self-control. Wisdom gives us understanding of a given situation, which is why even when things happen that we don't want to happen, we can keep our cool. That's what he says. We can have a cool spirit. We can remain calm even when things don't work out because God has given us understanding. But a fool has no understanding. A fool has no wisdom. So when things happen they don't like or don't expect, what happens? They fly off the handle. They get mad, they get frustrated, they get agitated, and they end up saying something they should not say. They don't know how to hold their tongue. They don't know how to keep quiet, which is why Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 5.3, for a dream comes through much activity, and a fool's voice is known by his many words. You can tell a fool because they just blah, 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 blabber, right? Blabber, blabber, blabber. Last verse, and it's very close to this one. Even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is deemed intelligent. Now, he just told us that when a wise person doesn't say anything, when he holds his tongue, it's a sign of his wisdom. He says even a fool, if he knows how to keep his mouth shut can give the impression that maybe he's wise. Maybe he isn't a fool. And so this is wisdom, right? When you don't want to look like a fool or, again, sound like a fool, what's the smartest thing to do? Just keep your mouth shut. Because it might seem like you're wiser than you really are. Abraham Lincoln said it this way, and I'm done tonight. It is better to keep your mouth shut and let them think you a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. I like that. 
I'll say it one more time. It is better to keep your mouth shut and let them think you a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. We'll pick it up next week, chapter 18. Let's pray tonight. Father, we love you, Lord, and we thank you as always, Lord God, for your word. Lord, thank you for every one of these Proverbs, Lord, each one precious, each one with wisdom and insight for our lives, Lord God, and what to do and what not to do, when to speak and and when not to, Lord. You talk about your justice and how, Lord, you see everything, and Lord, how you desire, Lord God, that we live right that we uphold justice, that we obey the laws of the land, and we respect those that you have put in our authority. So many lessons we learn, Lord. We thank you for all of them. I pray, Lord God, continue to give us a desire to learn more, to grow, to take the time to study, learn your word, to come to church, to tune in, Lord God, that we would not miss anything that you have for us. Lord, let us truly have that desire to know you more, Lord that we would fall more in love with you. We owe that to you. We love you. We thank you as always tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand